Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring technology and human potential. With me is Nicole Bradford, who is the CEO and founder of the Willow Group and the executive director and co-founder of the Transformative Technology Lab at Sophia University in Palo Alto, California. Prior to becoming a leader in transformative technology, Bradford was a senior executive in video games with responsibility for strategy, operations, and marketing for major brands that included Activision, Blizzard, Disney, and Vivendi games, including operating World of Warcraft in China. Nicole is a graduate of Singularity University and has an MBA from the Wharton School of Business. She is also the author of a novel called The Sisterhood, which is, in effect, also a teaching narrative. Once again, this interview is being conducted via the Internet, so now I'll switch over to that video. Welcome, Nicole. It's a pleasure to be with you. I've heard about your work for some years now and have had a chance to interview your partner, uh, Jeffrey Martin, a few times. So I'm uh, delighted to be with you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to sit down and talk with you. I've also heard really great things about you and also, you know, everything that you've done in the past with PBS and then the show now. And, and I'm just delighted. Can't wait to see what we cover. Okay. Well, I'm very interested in transformative technology, and I have been, gosh, for nearly half a century, I think. Uh, and I, I think it's fascinating what you're doing because you are a player at many different levels in this field in terms of sponsoring conferences, publishing a newsletter, organizing the industry, and also offering uh, the Finders course uh, yourself as one example of uh, a very significant transformative technology. Yeah, um, the... It's been, it's been fun. I mean, we've been, um, I've been working very diligently to build an ecosystem around transformative tech with the purpose and the intent of accelerating uh, the development of these types of technologies. Would it be helpful if I sort of like gave a definition of what I think transformative tech is? Yeah. Okay, cool. So writ very large, transformative tech is technology to support the human mind. But specifically, we divide that into three buckets. And the first one is mental health, emotional well-being, and then the third one is human thriving. What that lines up to is what I call future basics, because I want them to be the basic skills of the future, future of work, and then sort of future human, sort of future of life. Under the basic skills, um, it's mental health, emotional uh, health, and well-being. And then in the future of work, that's self-awareness and emotional self-regulation because those are two core things that sit up underneath creativity, collaboration, communication, basically humans working together, solving problems. And then the third part is future of life. And that's also that sort of where persistent non-symbolic consciousness and um you know, joy, and then also things that w would expand and enhance m human mental and emotional capacity. So that's also where, you know, an example of a technology would be brain computer interfaces, or I'm a big fan of Dr. David Eagleman's work on um, extending human senses. And so that's kind of the range. So it's basically human psychology, human mental and emotional capacity, assessed, amplified, and enhanced by technology. 
Mm-hmm. And I gather that there are hundreds of companies now working and developing uh, a wide variety of, of technologies and, and that each of these companies is evolving rapidly and interacting with other companies. So this is a very fast moving industry, although I suppose uh, many people haven't heard of it at all yet. You know, um, you're right. Many people haven't heard of it. And it is a very fast moving in- industry. And it's going to be one of the most influential industries. Um, are you, have you uh, read any of Yuval Harari's work? No, Homo I Homo Deus and haven't. Sapiens and... Oh, oh, you- oh, sure. Of course. Yes. Yeah. Homo Deus, Homo Sapiens. Of course I have. Yes. Absolutely. And so, you know, one of the things that he talks about in that book is how the next human agenda is going to be happiness, augmentation, and longevity. And so, you know, if you were to assign names to those as industries, um, those industries would be the longevity industry, which is going to be a really big one um, because most people actually don't want to be sick and they don't want to die. Um, the augmentation, which is going to start off with uh, bioengineering. So that's sort of like the, the bioengineering industry. And you see early things on that with like, um, you know, uh, uh, food and fabrications and a lot of things where they're sort of being bioengineered. Um, and then the last part is um, what he calls happiness um, which is really human psychology and how we think and feel. Um, and, and so that's the third industry, which is transformative technology. And they all, um, they're very different, but they all are being driven by the exponential. So, or are made possible by the exponential. So artificial intelligence and, um, machine learning, um, haptic sensors, computers, networking, robotics, um, you know, many of those are, are making these things possible. Um, and so they, they are different, but they will interrelate. So for example, there's no point in living forever if you're miserable yeah. the whole time. At a certain point, you won't want to do that anymore. Now, you used a term I'm unfamiliar with, haptic sensors. Could you define that? Okay, yeah. So, um, I'm really, maybe let me tell you about some of the things that I'm the most interested in um, that I just think are really cool. And haptics is one. Um, And so what a haptic is, is a haptic is is, is a sensor or a intervention that allows you to feel something. So, um, and it's really powerful. And it, it, you feel it on your skin. So David Eagleman's work, for example, is about, um, he gave a really big TED talk. Uh, and one of the things that they're able to do is by taking the feedback from a camera um, and tapping the image that the camera sees onto the skin, it takes about eight to nine weeks for a blind person to see. A person who, who cannot see through their eyes can see through their skin because the brain takes the data and turns it into something else. Mm. Uh, turns it into something understandable. So they're not seeing the way you and I can, but um, they can navigate a room. The same thing for, you know, people who are deaf. I'm really interested in how haptic um, capturing, well, well, capturing of our bio signals and our psychological state on the skin either our own to, you know, give greater levels of self-awareness or to others. Like, you know, I'm very interested in the future of work. And so uh, I'm wondering what would happen if you had a small team that had to come together very quickly, if they spent the first 24 hours with Veston that piped their um, heart rate variability you know, and they're, you know, these various biosignals to a pattern to one another. So they became that, you know, sensitive with, you know, that level of clarity about what, you know, other people on the team are feeling. 
Now, I know, for example, there are studies uh, of people in a religious service where their brain waves start in training with each other and other physiological measurements and train. But now that people are working on the Internet, as you and I are right at this very moment, it might be possible to create a similar kind of entrainment using this technology. That seems to be what you're suggesting. Well, it's also, you know, I mean, we're going to, um, with VR and AR, like one of the things that I believe that's a little, you know, you might not have heard it very often yet, but I think that the, that the barrier between digital and physical is artificial. Um, I think it's actually already gone, but we don't really see it that way yet. And I think that the insistence that there's a physical world and there's a digital world is forcing us to design things in a way that allow the digital world to dominate as opposed to, you know, designers insisting that the physical world may remain, you know, an essential part of design of anything. You know, I mean, we're, we're humans. We are designing and building these things and we can design, if we're thoughtful, we can design and build them to suit our purposes. And that purpose could include, you know, a design sensibility could include, um, humans are always brought back together face to face. Like that can be a design principle for a tech product. Mm -hmm. Um, or, you know, when humans meet in digital space, um, a lot of priority is given to their, um, being able to feel one another. So, you know, I've seen a lot of, um, interesting things where like one of the things I'm very interested in is, um, I pay a lot of attention to um, how realistic digital avatars are because, you know, you and I are talking and even, you know, me looking at you on a camera, I can see your expressions. So I can get that feedback loop that was developed on the Serengeti for me to understand how aligned are we, you know, how, how connected are we? And so the problem with most social and the internet right now is that it's flat, mm. you know? And so Facebook is a very flat thing and Twitter is a very flat thing. So when people are having these flame wars, they're not getting the feedback loop that, you know, would make them go, Oh, I, I, you know, wow, that actually hurt you. I didn't mean to do that. I just thought I was being clever. Um, you know, and so I think when we get to VR space, and we get to hyper, hyper realistic avatars where when you smile, when your avatar smiles or when your avatar like has like, you know, we have um, 122 facial expressions and we only control nine. At some point, your digital avatar will have the facial expressions that you do. And, you know, that's not a replacement for in person. But, you know, right now you and I are in different places. Mm. Um, and so sometimes that's the reality of modern life. And in those interactions, if I can feel you and see you the same as in the real world, I think we'll see a lot of the, you know, the digital like aggression, trolling, flaming is going to go down because there's basically too much biology behind us, um, you know, for people to in person um, do that the way that they do it now. Mm -hmm. Now, I was on uh, your website and watching the videos that you have of the various products that are coming out. And I saw uh, one company has designed a glove for VR, virtual reality person put on the glove and they said they were able to pick up a butterfly in virtual reality and then feel the butterfly fluttering in their hand because of this glove. So, I, I suppose if we each had gloves like that, even though we're thousands of miles apart, well, over a thousand miles, we could be shaking hands. Yeah, that's what the haptics will do. Mm -hmm. And so that's a haptic glove. Yeah, how interesting. Well, you mentioned Yuval Harari earlier, and his book Homo Deus suggests, I think the whole point of it is that humans are aspiring to have godlike powers and... uh 
as a parapsychologist myself. In, in fact, I'm very interested in, in that notion. I know some of the technology you know, featured on your website is of a parapsychological nature involving random event generators that have been used, for example, in the Global Consciousness Project. If you were, if you were to go back a thousand years, 2000 years with your iPhone and it worked, you would be a god, you know, in that context. So, you know, the idea that we are shaping, able to shape, um, our world in ways that our, um, ancestors never believed is possible. The fact that you could, the fact that you can check the weather and know what the weather is going to be most likely tomorrow or the day after, um, is a pretty godlike, you know, ability. So, you know, I think, you know, more so it's really that we're very curious. Um, and, you know, we kind of already have the, we already are what our ancestors would consider, um, you know, to be gods. Um, but I think really what's driving it is that humans are insatiably curious. And I think, you know, the, the big takeaway for me from, um, Harari's work, um, is the warning that he gives at the end of Homo Deus, where he talks about, um, datist. And those are the people who worship, the worshipers of data. And these are the people that forget that even though human beings trail a, a tremendous amount of, of data, um, there is something more to us. And so his big, you know, warning that just really struck me and is one of the things that, you know, got me back to talking about PNSE because that was mostly like Jeffrey talks about that stuff. And I'm deep tech evidence based, you know, medical mm. technology um, was Harari's book because he says at the end, um, he says that if human beings are reduced to data, then that is actually the greatest threat against humanism. And I, I love humanism. I believe, you know, this idea that every human um, is of importance and is of value. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons why I got into this space in the first place is a, like a profound belief in that. Um, and so to me, when I look at it, it's like, if we don't have a worldwide awakening, you know, um, if we don't, you know, push through for the end of suffering, uh, to use the old, the old language, um, then we do risk, you know, becoming a world where, you know, humans are only accumulation of data as opposed to, you know, human beings always being something more and just, you know, um, producing data, but we are not a product of our data. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, you know, it's a very nuanced difference, but it's one that either leads to um, freedom, you know, for all of mankind or a potentially servitude. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, we're in a very interesting environment. Uh, the, the global culture seems to be going through a lot of rapid changes as, as mm -hmm. well. One of the things that struck me when I began reviewing the various companies involved in this industry is there seems to be a big interest in using technology to simulate the sort of things that parapsychologists have been looking at for a long time, mind reading, for example, telepathy, or the ability, uh, we call it psychokinesis, but a, a simulation would be using signals from the brain to control uh, artificial limbs or other, uh, <laughs> yeah. other, other forms of technology. But, but the irony is, I think this technology is wonderful, but uh, to me, the irony is that in our age, we seem to have the, the masses of people, uh, especially the intelligentsia, the academics, the scientists, seem to reject the idea of real telepathy, uh, whereas the ancient people whom you were referring to uh, seems to me may well have had a better understanding of those things than, than we moderns do. Yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. And that's a, um, you know, that's actually something I've thought about it in a slightly different way, but I love the way that you kind of put it 
about how, you know, whether it's brain computer interface to control lost limbs or, uh, or, you know, um, uh, new limbs or whether it's, um, brain computer, um, interfaces to facilitate brain to brain communication. Um, it is sort of like, you know, mimicking that, you know, things that we've read about. And I think also, like, one of the things that I've thought about sometimes is that I think that, I do think that we're all connected. And sometimes I think that our social networks, the fact that we created them was really, you know, maybe a hunger to, you know, to make manifest and visual this thing that, you know, is also true. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I would say this one thing is, um, perhaps in the, you know, in the, in the ancient past, these things were common. And, and I mean, beyond the, you know, the, beyond the elders and the shamans and the, you know, and maybe they were common. Maybe they were something that every person had. I, when I think of all of the old myths that I've read, um, and, you know, from different parts of the world, it usually, they are usually read as one or two people had something, you know, and those people had a role in the society, but they didn't, they weren't read as like, this is what every single person has. Like every human has a nose for the most part, every human has a nose and every human, you know, has a mouth for the most part. Um, and so what technology brings is the possibility of anything that was available to the few becoming available to the many. And so, you know, technology is that thing that takes what is scarce abundant. So, you know, what a, you know, tech version of telepathy, which is, you know, specifically for those who are watching, uh, Mary Lou Jepsen is, has a company called Open Water. And Mary Lou's expertise is in miniaturizing consumer electronics. And she, with Nicholas Negroponte, was uh, one of the lead people on developing the $100 computer um, at a time that laptops were ten to $15,000. So basically taking the cost structure out of things and using the manufacturing capacity of consumer electronics to do so. She also has, um, uh, I think one of her, one of her degrees is in holography. Uh, so the use of light. Um, and so she's, you know, what she's working on right now is miniaturizing MRI machines mm-hmm. so that you could actually have an MRI, um, that's about that big that could be folded onto the skin like this. Um, and so it's not the same as putting someone in a tube, but, uh, it, cause it's slower, but you could actually do a full body like that just in tinier parts. Why hasn't anyone done that yet? So, um, that's what she's working on. She's doing it to revolutionize healthcare to get, for example, cancer diagnoses very quickly because you, you could just scan, be scanned easily. But the second part of it is that, um, you know, p- people who are in MRIs, when they watch a movie um, or watch a visual, the data off the brain can be reconstructed into the visual. And so with something like that, if, you know, both you and I had that device in a little hat, we could potentially just send brain images directly to one another. And so, you know, I think I agree with your point about we're just trying to do these things that, you know, perhaps we could do before. But I think what is slightly different would be that um, it would become something that every single human being could do, Mm -hmm. Um, that there would be no there would be no um, elite abilities for some of these things. Now, what happens is that the whole human, the whole curve will move. Mm -hmm. So when we can all do that, then we're going to see what the supers can do. Sure. People with more money will have more expensive uh, gadgets. Or more, you know, you know, um, like uh, to give you a different example, I, one of my goals is I think that, um, you know, one of the problems in our society is that uh, people, or here's the biggest problem is that people don't know how to be, they don't know how to become, and they don't know how to feel. 
And that causes most of the misbehaving. Like most of the misbehaving comes back to these three things. And a big part of that is social emotional ability, Mm -hmm. which we don't teach in our society anywhere. You are expected to pick it up from luck. And the religions used to teach it a little bit, but they also had other goals like recruitment and you know, like, like they have some other institutional goals other than just, you know, your, you know, social emotional maturity. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, with that, if we, you know, if we're able to use technology to um, fix the resource problem around being able to, you know, make that kind of learning more accessible to more people, then if we all have those skill sets, then you are going to see probably super impacts because someone's going to be super, super great at it. Um, and so I think there's a whole set of abilities that pe- human abilities mm-hmm. that we're going to see, um, you know, that, that are even going to probably surpass the, you know, the, the old stories about what humans mm-hmm. can do and be. I kind of view all of this technology um, as if we are creating an extension of our own nervous system, that uh, mm-hmm. the Internet, for example, is uh, sort of a, a physical manifestation of what the theologian Teilhard de Chardin um, 50, 60 years ago called the newosphere, the the mental uh what would you call it, um, the mental cloud <laughs> over the planet. But it makes me wonder if um, you're a meditator, I understand. Mm-hmm. For, and uh, meditation is about getting in touch, you know, with some deep parts of yourself. And I, I guess one of my concerns is that the the very idea that one can achieve greater capacities or higher states of consciousness, even through technology, may um, cause people to uh, rely on the technology and forget about their own inner life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think that that's valid. Um, I would say two things, and uh, and I know I've been running on, so I'll be brief. We'll take all all the time you like. (laughs) So what is that, you know, like, I don't know, about you, but when I started, uh, when I first learned how to ride a bike, my parents got me a banana bike, you know, with a banana seat Uh and two training wheels. Mm -hmm. And so um, there never was any belief that those training wheels would stay on. They came off once I could ride my bike. So a lot of these things are about design. Mm -hmm. You know, what, how do we design it? And are we, are we really being thoughtful when we think about what we design. And then there's ladders too, you know, like you go from the first grade to the second grade and the second grade to the third grade. So, you know, there's probably a combination of design, um, uh, you know, mastery paths. Um, and then a lot of it is like, what are the cultural norms around it? You know, like it took, it took 40 years to get people who smoke outside. Uh, but now there's very different cultural norms about smoking. Um, it took 20 years to get, get people off the road driving and drinking. You know, um, people are starting to sort of like change how they think about cell phones. And so, you know, on the other side, besides for design, there's what are the cultural norms that we establish around what do we value? you know, um, and what do we sort of aspire to? And so it's also possible to sort of like get cultural norms in place where, you know, people consider that they use these things just as bridges. And then they, you know, and then it's like the really awesome people, uh, you know, work on being naturals. Hmm. Well, I, another issue that uh, various researchers with whom I'm acquainted are looking at is, are certain personality types uh, better fits for different kinds of uh, modalities? Well, for example, different styles of meditation or, or yoga or psychotherapy. Are, are they appropriate for some personality types and not others? Uh, are you finding anything like that in the technology mm-hmm. field? Yeah, um, and I want to I want to just add one more thing to the other question. Okay. Um, and 
you know, because I share your concern about, um, you know, people overusing and losing touch with, you know, what they can do naturally. Um, the thing that really mitigates all of that for me is we don't actually have much time. Mm. Like as a species, we don't actually have much time in the sense that when this automation line rises and the jobs fundamentally change. So, you know, depending on the, depending on the, um, depending on the source, one, it's clear that no one knows, you know, what the true impact is going to be. Um, I've seen 800 million jobs gone by 2030. I've seen, I mean, 2050. I've seen 46% of all tasks. So within a job, I think the task is a better one because mm. within jobs, there's things that are rote and then there's things that are very human. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a huge, we have a huge rolling problem coming. And, and, um, and it's, it's one that can bring mass social destabilization. Um, and I think we've actually already seen the first taste of it. Um, if you look at, you know, if you sort of like dig into the, you know, the voting data from 2016 and where there were quite a few sort of protest votes, they were also in places where the jobs are gone. Now, the, some of those jobs went to China, but many of them went to automation. And that's just the amuse-bouche of what's coming. Mm -hmm. So we have a very serious problem coming that in order to, one, meet it, we're going to need our full capacity. Um, you know, and most people are ran by their minds, not the other way. This is like me before and after meditation. It's like a completely different person in terms of what I'm capable of doing. Um, so one, we're going to need our full capacity online. Two, we're going to have to ha have the fear go way down. Um, you know, and three, people are going to need to have um, social emotional abilities um, that I think, you know, meditation fosters because that's what they're going to have to, they're going to have to work with other people really well to be compensated. Mm -hmm. So that will be the basis of how people get compensated and it will be the basis of how they, um, how they, respond and react and, and adapt to change. And so because of those things, it's like we've got like, you know, by time that bill comes due, let's say 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, if you're being the only difference, by the way, between a, a an optimist and a pessimist in this space is the timeline. It's not if it's when. Mm. And so we have so very little time to, you know, right now we're sitting at seven and a half billion people on the planet. By 2050, we're going to be at eight and a half billion. We have so very little time to create a new standard, you know, of, you know, to get Ken, Wil Ken Wilbury about it, wake up, grow up, clean up. We have so very little time for that. Sure, there will be people who, um, you know, who don't want to, you know, learn to feel for themselves. Um, but there are so many people who don't know how to feel at all today. Like really like, who am I? What's going on inside of me? Mm -hmm. Um, and we have got to move to that place because it's like the way I describe it is I say, you know, we're, we're either on the path to Starfleet or hunger games, you know, it's like one or the other. Um, and the next 15 years will decide which one is happening. And so with that, you know, it's like we have to have faster ways of doing things. And technology is scalable, accessible, and affordable. You can get something deployed all over the world. Uh, and we kind of have to. Uh, so with urgency, I, I just, I don't really see, you know, the old-fashioned way is a little slow. Mm -hmm. and, and we can't afford it. So what you're saying is that there is a demand that uh, people on the planet uh, start actualizing their their potentials that we can't continue to operate uh, on on the basis of 90% uh, of our potentials go unrealized because the challenges that we face are too great. Yes. Yes, but it's also an opportunity because 
The other thing that's happening is that for the first time in human history, um, thriving is going to be a requirement and not a luxury. Like we've always considered it a luxury um, and the things that come out of thriving and flourishing and, you know, and, um, you know, essentially human potential. It's it's been something for the rich, for the few, for the not too busy, mm -hmm. you know, but that is going to change. And uh, and so that's an opportunity. We, you know, for the first time in human history, um, you know, the need, demand and means are aligned that we can actually make this something um, that is accessible for all human beings mm -hmm. as opposed to just a few. Mm -hmm. Now, when I look out at the human population, I, I see uh, a lot of warning signs, to be honest. I, mm -hmm. I see, uh, for example, I believe the statistic is about 30% of uh, the American population will at some point in their life have a mental illness diagnosis. Um, schizophrenia, depression, uh, these, these are enormous problems in our culture, not to mention child abuse and people who come from, uh, dysfunctional families. Do you, do you think that technology is capable of helping people address these deep issues? Absolutely. Um, so one of the things I'm really interested in is, now this isn't at science yet, but there's a, um, there is a correlation between people who are depressed um, and a major um, uh, uh, major issues in the gut biome. Mm. So you know, and so it's not it's not hard science yet. It's just something that people are noticing. Yeah. What that could mean is that um, you are you know, rather than an SSRI for, or, you know, a mood enhancer or something like that, that affects all of your neurochemistry. Um, you know, you could get an engineered probiotic that you take and it refreshes your gut biome and that completely, you know, changes your, um, psychological state. You know, that's like, that is a real sort of possibility. Um, you know, other things include, um, you know, I actually really like feedback mechanisms because, you know, gravity is an excellent feedback mechanism. That's how we learn to walk. Mm -hmm. So we get a lot of feedback, you know. Um, and so I think that uh, feedback on our um, on our patterns, on our behaviors, on our um, bio signals provided it's private. So I actually work very hard. I'm on in several conversations. I'm working very hard to bring in privacy ethics and data sovereignty because um, it needs to be private. But if it's private, um, then, you know, human beings actually have really bad memory. And if you've looked at any of the sort of like data on human memory, it's actually like we're not very good at it. Um, you know, we remember kind of what we want to remember. <laughs> you know, it's selective, um, you know, all those things. And so you know, the ability to know that, you know, your worst day came from, you know, you ate broccoli on Tuesday, you had a fight with your wife on Wednesday, you, you know, took a bath on Thursday, and then you ran three miles on Friday. And somehow that's the combination, you know, that either, you know, makes you not be able to do the things you want, or, you know, maybe the makeup moment on Saturday made your presentation on Monday the best you've ever given. Mm -hmm. You know, like we don't have the ability to track that kind of data or to or to find those kind of connections. Those certainly, you know, they're there. And so I think that'll be really interesting. I think, though, one of the things that we have to do, and you didn't ask this, but I want to add it. Um, I'm actually not a datist. I love data, but I'm not. I love mystery. Mm -hmm. And so I think that you know, the, I think that one of the things that's going to be important with this is, um, you know, we should use data and technology to raise the floor on what our abilities are and, and, and universally all of us. And then, you know, 
have on the, you know, so it's like we should, you know, use it to understand our humanity, but we should also, you know, insist that we are more than data. So we should use the data, but insist that we are more than data. So we should keep a buffer of mystery and, you know, curiosity and things that we don't know. Because hmm. that, that also really motivates us too. And so should we, we should always have this like, you know, um, this sort of like leading edge of mystery, you know, that we are exploring and, you know, and, and asking questions about. Well, what you, you're saying is that technology can be put into the service of self-awareness. Yes. That's, that's a very interesting idea. I, just for myself, you know, I first learned about uh, biofeedback when I was a college oh. student. That was many decades ago, and everybody was getting into it then. It was really exciting. Uh, biofeedback research was just getting off the ground. And for myself, I made a decision that uh, not to go in that direction, probably just because of my own inclinations. But what I was thinking at the time was that I've already got this body, this is the most amazing technology. If I can just learn how to use it, uh, that would be more than enough of a challenge. Uh, but, but you're saying that with technology, people can do that better. Yes. Yeah. Like uh, sometimes, you know, I, so I went to Singularity in 2015, Singularity University, and I did the global solutions program and, and I, really loved it. Um, but because of that affiliation, and I'm also a lecturer there, hmm. uh, because of that affiliation, people often ask me if I, like Ray Kurzweil, am interested in being uploaded into a computer. And I'm not because, or at least not yet, because <laughs> like you, this is like we, you know, we haven't even maxed this out. There's so much here. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Today's success in life, like the most successful people, many of them have the ability to self-regulate, you know, and, uh, and they also like one of the most important skills for success is meaning making. Mm -hmm. What are the stories that you tell yourself? Um, and remind me to tell you a really interesting, uh, um, study that Stanford did on that. But, you know, these sorts of things, um, and so, my interest is I want those abilities to be universal. I want those abilities to be universal at extremely high skill levels. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm interested in humanity having some new problems. Like we truly need some new problems. We've had the same problems for a really <laughs> long time, right? Poverty, you know? disease, racism, those problems you mean? Yeah, you know, ego, fear, mm -hmm. um, you know, same problems. Like I'm interested. I think it would be fun if like, you know, 50 years from now, you and I were, you know, catching up and you, we were talking about, you know, our kids and, you know, and we're sitting around and, and we say something like, you know, kids today, they just, they just won't spend time in solo consciousness. They just, you know, they, they just don't understand that they should you know, be in solo consciousness <laughs> at least two or three hours a day. I mean, we're not asking about it a lot. You know, like, let's get some new problems, come up mm -hmm. with some things that, you know, we haven't had to deal with before, as opposed to the same old, same old, over and over and over again, which mostly can be distilled down to, we don't know how to be, you know, peace inside ourselves, we don't know how to become, and we don't know how to feel. Not really how to feel. Like your partner, Jeff Martin, I also have an interest in higher states of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm aware that there is a, a lot of technology that uh, out there that can induce uh, a wide variety of meditative states and uh, other uh, exotic states of concentration, visualization. And, uh, well, I think that, um, I think that those are very, I think they're very interesting. Um, you know, probably, what you might be thinking about is um, the um, uh, deep brain ultrasound, uh, yeah, which, yeah. Looks, which looks like it has the potential to do that. Um, I'm also personally obsessed by the vagus nerve. Um, I think when we really learn how to 
um, stimulate um, the vagus nerve, we're going to have a great deal more control um, over our um, psychological state and psychological well-being. Um, and maybe what tripped me over is like when I found out that, you know, not only does the vagus nerve wrap around your entire stomach and, you know, go up to your brain, but it's also that the female orgasm runs on the vagus nerve, not the spine. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's like this... It's like this incredible magic nerve, you know, uh -huh. that, um, you know, that has a great deal to do with psychological well-being. So, mm -hmm. you know, the very first um, FDA devices came out for vagus nerve stimulation came out last year. And um, um, and so, you know, within two to three years, vagus nerve stimulation will be completely routine. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, many with many products being FDA approved, like the the one in 2018 was for migraines. Um, but, you know, there's another, people are using it. Uh, Dr. Bashar Badran has been using it to train premature children how to suckle. Because it turns out that, you know, somehow that happens in the womb, you know, uh, in the last month or so. And if you're born before that, they don't know how to, mm -hmm. they don't know how to, um, like they don't have the mouth movements to do it. Um, and so he uses vagal nerve stimulation for that. So, you know, there's, there's so many interesting things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that like one of the things that we found that is that this is a good point to make is that, um, many of the things like, so human psychology is a little bit of a spectrum in that it's kind of, and that's kind of how we have it laid out. It's like the, the you know, future basics, future work, future human, and there's, um, you know, things that support, help people with impairments, you know, which might be depression, resilience issue. Um, and then there's things that, you know, are the doorways to, um, you know, more unique states of consciousness. Mm -hmm. But the hardware and software, often the same. And that's actually really exciting. Oh. Because I imagine if I'm an investor, I want to invest uh, where I think I'll get the, the biggest bang for my buck. And that's probably going to be helping people with their various handicaps and disabilities. But what you're saying is that that very same technology can then be applied to uh, people who don't have disabilities but want to push to uh, an even higher abilities, level. Abilities, higher super abilities, yes. Yeah. It's the same it's, you know, it's, it's often the same technology. Mm -hmm. It's the same hardware and software. And what's different is the protocols, Yeah. you know, so, you know, if you can, because if you think about it, like if you can, um, you know, if you can use an engineered probiotic to deal with depression, um, you can probably use an engineered probiotic at some point, um, to, you know, to have your best week ever mm. for optimization. If you, you can use a vagus nerve stimulator, like, cause the, the, you know, the, the medical understanding around, um, stimulating the vagus nerve to relieve tension and, and migraines, um, you could probably also get to euphoria on the other side. Probably, mm -hmm. you know, if you can use, a, um, a, you know, behavior pattern tracker to, um, you know, to track cognitive decline, you can also probably track, um, you know, perfect optimization. Mm -hmm. um, if you can use haptics and emotion recognition um, to, um, you know, have a meeting with someone in Bangalore and feel like you're really there, you can probably also use it to maintain a long distance relationship with someone who's stationed on the moon, you know? So it's like, it's the same thing. It's just different uses. And mm -hmm. so to your point, it's like, you know, companies have to start by solving a current problem. Like, you know, SpaceX is all about getting to Mars, but what they do today is they put satellites up cheaper than anybody ever would or has and transformed an industry because of that. But they're really all about Mars. That, that's the vision. And so it's the same thing in the sense that companies have to solve a, a problem right now that someone has because they have to be able to pay their employees and 
pay rent on the on the office space and they, everybody needs health insurance. Um, so they have to solve a real problem today, but often, you know, the things that they have to learn and understand uh, bring something else, like Mary Lou Jepsen revolutionizing healthcare will also bring us brain to brain telepathy. Now, you asked me to remind you uh, to talk about a study at Stanford University. Uh, Oh, yeah. Meaning, I believe. Yeah, it was um, basically what they did is they took um, three populations or three age groups. So middle school, high school and college. And it was a uh, it was an in-person intervention, but middle school, high school and college. Um, The teachers, they did it properly. So like the teachers didn't know who got which intervention because the teachers weren't there to see which kids were in which rooms. Um. And they taught them how to make meaning. And they had a control group. One did that, one did not. And then there were three types of kids because they did separate ones. One were children who were bullied of all races and genders. Um, Two, girls. And then the third was children of color because that's sort of like what you can get money to do studies around. And they taught them the intervention, which was a total of an hour and a half. And then they did not come back until the end. So graduation from middle school, graduation from high school, graduation from college. And they looked at real measures of, you know, success, grades, attendance, willingness to go on to the next level. Um, and in all of those groups, the people who had simply been taught in an hour and a half how to make meaning had significantly higher grades, graduation rates, willingness to go on to the next level. And so, you know, the person who told me about this, who's uh, on the uh, faculty, he basically said is that you don't have to fix the world before you have, you know, an intervention that can completely change someone's life and ability to be success successful. So we don't have to have misogyny fixed in order to change how girls perform. We don't have to have racism fixed. Um, in the um, bullying, and not the, I'm not saying that we shouldn't, but it's just often yeah. when people think about these big problems, or like when they think about, you know, the mind of humanity, you know, and all the rage and fear and all of this stuff, it's like, oh, it's such a big problem, how are you going to fix it? Well, it's like, you just start, it, you know, with interventions that work, enabled by technology, deployed at scale, building hard ties to the academics, but also making sure that you build things that People will use, um, and you just start to fix it. You just start to nibble the cracker, and eventually, you know, if uh, if you have enough little fish nibbling the cracker, the cracker breaks and it's gone. And so that's you know that's a really inspiring, I think, study. Um, there's a you know a quick aside. One of the reasons why it came up is that um, I really think the ability for the smart things in our world to challenge our meaning. Like you could do that. A good example would be, it's a little mm, tweaky, but la- the um, children's echo with Amazon, and I know Amazon's trying to sell things, but it just that point aside, um, the children's echo uh, won't be, won't uh, execute the command without a please or thank you. Oh. And they did that because the year before there were a lot of parents saying, Alexa's making my kids rude. Because the Alexa command structure is kind of rude. You would never speak to another human being that way. Um, but now the children's echo, which will read books that you buy on Amazon. <laughs> <is a> little, <laughs> but the kids can't use it without saying please or thank you. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if we really think as designers, you know, about this sort of thing, like if you had a personal AI and, you know, and, you know, you were set in at, or, you know, if I have a personal AI and one day I'm looking at myself and, you know, and, it, and I'm looking at my mirror and I'm like, gosh, I look old. No one's going to love me. Then, you know, CBT tables are pretty straightforward. Is that true? Or Byron Katie, is it true? How do you know it's true? How does it make your body feel when you think it's true? How would you be if it wasn't true? You know, you don't even have to have a response to that. Like, it doesn't have to, you know, Byron Katie's stuff just works. It just works. 
you know, even without yeah. a response. So technology can do these types of things um, with privacy. Um, and we could see, you know, greater, greater levels of, you know, psychological health and well-being. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, because it's hard to talk to someone. You know, you do have few people who, you know, get to persistent non-symbolic consciousness because they have a, you know, have something happen. Like you have those Eckhart Tolle stories. Um, but it's kind of hard to talk to people about, you know, a mom about enlightenment when a new mom who can't sleep, who's got a newborn, who's, you know, and who's having postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to go back a little bit, though, to the uh, Stanford study of making okay. making meaning. They they went through a one-hour process of making meaning, and then you began referring to Byron Katie's work, which it, what oh, little sorry. I know about it involves asking questions, uh, certain questions that can be very productive. Is is that what uh, the making meaning no, is I'm, about? I'm sorry, I, I I sort of jumped. Uh, meaning making as a skill. Yes. Uh, and so they just studied, you know, if you teach people how to make empowered meaning, how does it show up in their lives with measurable outcomes? I, I'm and just so, curious as to what that actually means. I guess I assumed that people make meaning naturally all the time. They make meaning naturally, but they don't make empowered meaning mm -hmm. naturally. Mm -hmm. So it's like, what role do you play in the story that happens to you? So, mm -hmm. you know, you can, you know, you can walk into a room in a presentation. It's like the difference between growth mindset and uh, a fixed mindset. So, mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you, if something happens and it's because there's something wrong with you, mm -hmm. as opposed to something happened, you know, say kids getting bullied. If you're getting bullied because there's something wrong with you, or if you're getting bullied because there's something awesome about you, it's you'd like you're going to respond in two completely different ways to that. Mm -hmm. It's going to affect, you know, other things about your life. And so that, that's how it works. So that was separate from, you know, the Byron Katie part, that I was see. sort of like, here's this analog, you know, fleshy intervention, delivered analog, human to human, so simple, they could do it, in, it was an hour and a half, mm -hmm. so simple, they could do it in an hour and a half. And it has measurable changes in performance of young people at, mm -hmm. you know, in measures that matter to society, an hour and a half. If you took that and you um, were able to deliver it in a very private, constant, personal way via technology, mm -hmm. then that is a skill that you could have, that everyone could have. You could put it on an app. You could put it in the walls of your house. Uh -huh. You could put it in your car. You could put it in your mirror. You could put it in your Alexa. You know, it or could your be clothing, I suppose. It could be in your clothing. <laughs> it could be in a variety yeah. of places. Mm -hmm. And so the the whole Byron Katie Alexa kind of riff. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I see. I'm like, I know. I get it. A, I see where you're going with this. Yeah. Um, that just was like, hey, here's something really simple that technology could do today. You could do that today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, command structures would be a little like you'd have to work that out, but that's deployable today yeah. because the Byron Katie questions don't require someone like it's not like like replicating an actual therapist is really hard because you need to have another human being, mm. you know, like what like what a really talented therapist does. But CBT tables, cognitive behavioral tables that question how you make meaning or even the Byron Katie examples, which people who watch your show might have heard about. Mm. Um, you know, Byron Katie's not sitting there listening to your answers, but purely the asking of the questions. Mm -hmm. Well, there was you know, a computer program called Eliza back in the 1960s yeah. that emulated uh, Carl Rogers' client-centered therapy. And my understanding is it passed the Turing test. People, There were people who didn't realize they were interacting with a computer. They thought it was a therapist. What's making a lot of this possible is what's called exponential curves. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, um, you know, the, just what happens, how fast exponential technology moves. 
Mm-hmm. And, um, and so, you know, what's different now than 20 years ago or 30 years ago, um, you know, in the old, the old Eliza is, um, now, you know, with deep learning and neural nets and a bunch of other stuff, this stuff gets exponentially better mm-hmm. every single year. Yeah. Well, you know, my intuition is that uh, the human species as a whole is beginning to take control of our own biological evolution. And it seems to me that it's leading us towards becoming sort of uh, a an entirely new kind of species. You could say cyborgs, sort of half biological and half digital. Uh, I, I think we're moving in that direction. And all the skin piercing that people are doing almost strikes me as a uh, preparation for that. I would say that we're already there. Mm. Like I can't get any place without my phone mm. direction wise, you know, like, I mean, I probably could, but <laughs> you know, like how would I call an Uber? <laughs> you know, like, it's just like, so I would say we're already there. Yeah. Uh, we just haven't taken it down to the cellular level. You know, that's very interesting. I sometimes feel if I go out of the house without my phone that I've, I've left part of myself back. In the- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. I mean, right now, like one of the, some of the big things that need to happen is that like screens are horrible. Like this thing, the form factor on this is terrible. Oh. Um, and so this will go away. Mm-hmm. Like we, we're not going to have these for too much longer. They're going to become... They're going to go into the background mm-hmm. um, and all of it will be connected. But this is like a lot of people. So this is an interesting point. A lot of people like when you see a lot of the art about screens, it looks like there's usually zombies holding phones and everyone sort of, you know, yeah. um, really having a, a lot of concern about this form factor. Mm-hmm. But basically it's like getting, you know, Basing one's entire strategy off of this or a reaction to this, that's like getting bent out of shape over a stone wheel. Mm. Like, like this is a stone wheel. Okay. What's coming is so, you know, is so much different. And if it's well designed, it'll be very integrated. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm aware of the Google glasses, but they didn't seem to go anywhere. Well, you know, they, um, there's a thing to launching stuff before it's time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they did a public launch when really the application is enterprise. So Google Glasses are doing fantastic in enterprise. Oh. So doctors, surgeons, um, people who, you know, people who have jobs where they need their hands. So, um, you know, electricians, um, you know, uh, warehouse, like lots of jobs mm. where people use their hands, um, are being, are having smart goggles added to it. So like if you're, you know, if you work for the electrical company or, and, uh, you need to see where the lines are in a house mm. so you don't cut something to have them have the floor plans on your, you know, in front of you at the same time that you're using your hands. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... so I thought it those, was a fantastic idea when I first saw the uh, publicity for it, but in fact, I was imagining I would get one, but they've never really been uh, available as far as I know. Yeah, you know, I mean, they, they took it inside and made it, uh, did business applications, mm-hmm. and that's where not just Google, but a bunch of other companies, uh-huh. that's sure. very fast moving category and it will move back out, but they mm-hmm. have to be subtle. I mean, part of the reason why Google Glass didn't take off is that you looked weird, you know, like people looked <laughs> weird yeah. when you wore them and, um, you know, people were uncomfortable with the privacy issues. Mm-hmm. So the initial launch did not address privacy. It was early for cultural norms Um, and you looked weird. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was like, it was those things, but the world has moved. And so, you know, I think you're going to see more of those types of things coming back out. Mm -hmm. Well, Nicole, I know we could talk for a long time about this. We haven't even begun to uh, address the ethical issues involved, uh, 
but I, I can say this, uh, I think you're doing incredibly interesting uh, work, and it's been a very enlightening conversation. <laughs> well, I want to say two things, Ben, because yeah. I actually have, I have 10 minutes. Um, okay. Two things that are very important to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, one is that, um, like, for our two-day conference, um, I spent three hours of a two-day conference, which is a big deal, uh, focused on ethics, mm-hmm. privacy, and data sovereignty. Mm-hmm. Like, I think we have got to get this right. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not one of those people who is so in love with technology that, you know, I think it's just going to work out, work out itself. You know, like we have got to get ethics, privacy, and data sovereignty. People must choose. They must give consent. They must know what's going to happen with their data. They must have the ability to edit their data. They have, must have the ability to control their data. And so that is a big part of my platform, pushing for that. And then the second thing, um, we spent five hours, I dedicated five hours of a two-day conference to founder development. And this is to, this is really about, you know, mental, emotional, and spiritual maturity. It's like the meditation stuff, all the stuff that we, you know, you and I are into. Um, because if you don't, these technologies are so powerful um, and they can be so invasive because we are revealed, like we are revealed. You know, your level of stress shows up in the exhale of the CO2 combination in the exhale. Um, so like, you know, your entire state is knowable. Mm. Um, and so that is the, those are very powerful, um, technologies, but we need them. We need them for the reasons why I've just, that I've described to you Mm -hmm. and we need them urgently. Um, but you know, one of the things that you see in the rest of tech is that a lot of people as they're starting to realize the implications of AI, um, genetic engineering, you know, a bunch of other, those, those things, there's, there is a, um, there is one response, which is to stop. Um, but the problem for us is that we can't, and I mean, mankind, we can't stop. But the challenge with innovation is that it's very hard for me to sit here in this moment and tell you everything that can go wrong. You know, like I can't think of all the things and what will go wrong will be things that we never imagined. And so what's really important is to have, you know, founders and investors who are awake who are mentally and emotionally mature so that as the unintended consequences start to stack up, you know, like I don't think, you know, Mark Zuckerberg in Harvard was like, I want to destabilize the political, I want to destabilize and shred the social fabric of the United States. You know, he didn't say that um, when he was in college, but when it became clear about four years ago that that's what was happening, they denied it. You know, they did a whole bunch of other stuff before they finally, like, took accountability for it. And that's where, you know, founder development is really important because you're going to have to be very flexible and adaptive. And we're not going to know what's coming. And then we have to be, you know, uh, we have to be in a place with our own egos that we do, do the right thing for the people who trust us with their most personal data. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's, so those are two things that are very important to me. And it's a big part of all of our work and our platforms. And we have a conference in November, everybody. If you like this stuff, come. We have an online academy. People who want to build this, we have an online program where you can take from anywhere in the world. Um, and, um, it's in October, September, October. And we help you think through your businesses. Um, and think about, you know, the company that you want to build. And if you have a company, we'll get you mentors. Um, and then we also have, uh, city chapters. Uh, we have chapters in 15 cities now around the world. Um, and growing. We're in 69 countries and 450 cities of entrepreneurs and innovators who want to build transformative technology for the benefit of all mankind. And we uh, will include a link to your websites in the description attached to this video. So people can click directly. Okay, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, Nicole. I'm really glad to have had this time with you. And I'm looking forward to uh, seeing how uh, your 
industry evolves and, and how your laboratory evolves. Thank you. Thank you very much. I look forward to uh, having you back again sometime in the future and uh, we can reflect together on the enormous <laughs> changes that will undoubtedly have occurred. Cool, cool. Um,